So, uh, I, I don't know how many times I've mentioned the fact that I've been obsessing a lot about Square research output, I'm not trying to solve all the hunger here, it's uh, trying to quantify publishing output by faculty, right? I'm sure people would be wondering, but why? Is that an important problem, really? To try and, uh, and hunt for Square research output. I don't know if I'm making sense here. You know how there are certain problems that are considered important? Uh, I've been obsessing a lot on this myself. Anyway, and so uh, what we did last last year, after interacting with uh, the IR manager at the University of Zambia, the University of Zambia has an institutional repository. This is a platform, a portal where all research output is supposed to be deposited. This is where you will find dissertations and theses that have been produced by past students. All you have to do is go to dispense.unza.zm. Not only that, this is where you find things that uh, Maimbo Nyerenda, Jackson Piri, uh, Monica have published in the past. They're supposed to be there as preprints. It turns out uh, at Unza, um, if you look at what we discovered, we did this, this is a paper we wrote, and, uh, is, um, uh, a study we conducted, work we did, where we discovered that there's a, there's a delay, right, insofar as ingestion of content into the repository is concerned. So if you were to go to dispers.unza.zm, you will, lo and behold, you will not find things that were submitted in 2018. Oh, sorry, in 2019 now. There's a backlog, right? So there's a huge, there are huge time gaps in between when a student actually submits that dissertation to DRGS and when it finds itself in the repository. And it turns out the reason is simple. There's no self-archiving implemented. So if you're a student, I don't know, I do, uh, under normal circumstances, you should log into the platform and deposit that thing yourself and then someone just verifies. But lo and behold, you submit that to DRGS on CD, shockingly, right, in 2020. Uh, they still do that. DRGS will compile the batches, take them to the library. The library has two people, two people that do a couple of things. They will prepare descriptive information, which is metadata associated with each manuscript. So imagine a situation where you write your dissertation, you submit to DRGS. DRGS would have to prepare descriptive information, name, supervisor, subjects associated with that dissertation. Is it computer hardware? Uh, is it software engineering or something, right? Um, and they, some of these things they have to do by reading your abstract, right? For them to come up with subject headings, as librarian, they're trained to read through text, they read your title, read your abstract, and then decide to say, ah, this, this dissertation should be mapped onto this classification. It has to be done that way, right? And you notice that uh, uh, in computing, for instance, there's a SEM CSS or something, for instance, that is used to properly tag computer science uh, literature, right? It's a manual process. Tagging and ingestion of one item might take as long as one hour, apparently. And now we're not speculating here. We worked with students and we conducted thorough studies where we went there and had focus group discussions and interview sessions. That's how bad the situation is now. So imagine a situation where let's okay, fine. Maybe it takes 30 minutes to to prepare one document. How long would it take to ingest everything that is generated at Unza? 850 plus faculty or academic staff plus the students that graduate every year. A lot of them now. Only two people are involved, which is why we have a backlog, right? Not only that, the other problem is because it's a manual process, the information that these people uh, enter is mostly wrong, right? Mistakes are made when you're tired and whatnot, right? Anyway, this is the problem we're trying to solve last time. So we set out to automate this process. And so we're saying, instead of having a human being prepare the metadata and then submit that dissertation to the repository, can you automatically classify the repository? Right, this is a solution that we came up with. Can we automatically classify this repository I mean, sorry, this manuscript, and then uh, tag it with appropriate uh, descriptive information and then ingest it into the repository. The only intervention we would need is for one of those two people to come and say, oh, this classification does make sense, it's fine. If there's a problem, make 
a minor change. So instead of you spending one hour, 30 minutes, maybe just spend five minutes there, right? So I came up with uh, classification models here. So what I'm going to explain as I'm walking through through the CRISP DM data model are the things that we did, right? Type this solution here. Well, I mean, we propose this sort of mechanism where we're using what we think is a single source of truth. That PDF document that you submit to DRGS, we think, we can safely assume that there's correct information in there. Forget about this other descriptive information that is added by these human beings. Think about the content that you find in the dissertation from the cover page all the way up to the last page of the dissertation or the, man the thesis manuscript. Um, and really, so what we did was we implemented this model that uh, is able to automatically classify the type of the ETD, the subject associated with the ETD, and the collection where that ETD is supposed to go into. If you go to the repository, ETDs are clustered into whether it's School of Natural Sciences, School of Education, School of Vet, and whatnot, right? <coughs> anyway, so walk us through what we did. And the first step, obviously, business understanding, right? Identification of those things we are calling specific, uh, coming up with the general objective and the specific objectives. Um, so our objective was just to automatically classify ETDs. Simple objective, right? And the goal was to automate the manual workflow that these people go through. Um, so we conducted a situational analysis, which actually took the form of, uh, there are only two studies that we've done, I think about two so far. These have been, were carved out as a capstone project, so final year projects. Um, and as, as part of these small little, uh, we're calling them small because they're done by, by undergraduate students here, we conducted interviews with uh, the people that are responsible for this. Right? Uh, we also were part of workshops that were being conducted to try and understand what these people do, the process they go through. It's part of the situation analysis, right? Um, well, we wouldn't say that we came up with uh, a standard uh, project plan here because this is still work in progress. Um, granted, these are the small little studies that I just spoke about had their own associated project plans, right? But under, I mean, in an ideal case, you want to come up with a project plan. Um, so we set out to identify data sources. And for us, really, it was simple because we were, we were trying to automatically classify ETDs. We identified two key data sources, the actual PDFs that the students submit, and in as much as the information that those two people provide by way of descriptive information, in as much as we know that that's not accurate information, but we use that as a data source. Uh, and um, we used it because we needed a basis when coming up with uh, a, a training set, test training set, right? Uh, in an ideal case, we should have uh, had people label these, uh, these different observations, but we decided to use the already tagged information in the repository as a basis for uh, coming up with a, a training set and test it. <clears throat> so PDF manuscript, the PDF document, and descriptive information, see Dublin coin encoded metadata, right? I'll explain a bit more about this. Um, and then in terms of extracting a collection of data, it was pretty trivial for us. All we did was we just harvested the PDFs. I think at the time it was about 3,400 manuscripts from as far back as, I um, can't remember when, B because uh, uh, they're still in the process of digitizing historical ETDs, I think we would be surprised if we had ETDs from the 60s or 70s, but maybe they're there. But anyway, what we did was, because we conducted this study towards uh, the end of 2018, somewhere there, I think, so we got data that was in the repository as of this time, everything, about 3,400, somewhere there. So we got all those PDF documents, um, and we harvested them using a protocol called um, uh, the Open, Use exchange. Open Archives Initiative, Open uh, is it Object Reuse Exchange Protocol, OIORE. Uh, what this does is allows you to harvest actual bit streams from repositories. Uh, the UNSA repository actually runs off a platform called DSpace, and DSpace implements this protocol, so it was a lot easier for us. And then we harvested the metadata, the descriptive information, using a protocol called OIPMH. Right. 
uh, Open Archives Initiative product for metadata harvesting, <coughs> right? So it's an automated process, scripts implemented, just pull the information. Um, for the for the PDFs, I think there's an explanation. It wasn't as trivial because we had to, we have a situation where some PDF documents are uploaded, um, so you have the preamb preamble documents, the preliminaries uploaded separately from the body, from the bibliography, right? So we needed a way to manage that information and be able to figure out which of those parts was the cover page, for instance, and whatnot, right? By the way, data collection, right? Standard methods that we are using. The importance we will learn once we do the the research course here with Dr. Jackson P is that the importance of explaining all these things is you want ultimately science is centered around what is it science and research reproducibility, right? You want somebody else to be able to do what you did and be able to get the same results, or at least results that are as close as possible to what you're doing. This is why you have to obsess a lot about methodology, right? Um, anyway. <coughs> right, I mean, so the exploratory data process, the description of the data took the form of just a uh, graphing, you know, just trying to find out a um, uh, uh, number of dissertations by school, for instance. Um, web clouds, uh, when you analyze the abstracts, right, which words are more prominent, right? And for us, that was important because it turns out that uh, you'll be able to identify domain specific stop, stop words. In an ideal case, you can use maybe stop words from the English dictionary because all dissertations at UNSA are supposed to be in English, it's in the guidelines. But you will probably find words like Zambia in there. That should be a stop word, it's not important, right? It's specific to this domain, which is owns in this case. But anyway, um, and then the quality of the data as well was assessed. So in terms of the data preparation, because most of the uh, input data was text data, texture data, obviously we did a lot of text preprocessing. Uh, so case 4D, normal, normalization, right? Before inputting the, um, I guess, the data into these learning algorithms, make sure that uh, we use a Consistent, consistent casing, right? In Python is quite easy, as is the case for most languages, actually, right? Uh, NLTK, you can use that. Removing stop words, because those are irrelevant. Removing punctuations, full stops, commas, um, semicolons. Again, I mean, most programming languages will have uh, features that allow you to identify like a set of punctuations, right? You have to be careful though. Um, <coughs> certain, certain things or characters might be classified as punctuations, but in certain esoteric fields like maths and maybe chemistry, maybe they might have some significance. I don't know, right? I don't know if that's making sense. Uh, but, but you can safely assume that that's, it's fine. You, I mean, the, the impact that that would have if you remove punctuation wouldn't really be that much. And then removal duplicates. Believe it or not, we had because human beings are involved in this process, there were a number of uh, duplicates, duplicate records or entries in here. Right, so we had to remove all those different things. Um, so again, in terms of data sources here, this is this visual representation of the things we are looking for. Um, most, if not all, the input was text, I think. It was text, actually. Um, so Dublin coin coded metadata, this is descriptive metadata. Uh, this is just a visual representation of um, uh, an input, input, input text features from the cover page, right? This is how your typical cover page for an UNSA dissertation or thesis looks like. Title on top by your name for people in medicine or something, apparently you need titles. And then somewhere below here you have uh, University of Zambia or something and the year, right? That was important for us because the text on the cover page was used as input features for one of the classification models. I'll explain just now. <clears throat> Feel free to interrupt me if you have a specific question, right? So, remember I said we have a descriptive uh, Dublin coin coded metadata. This is how the information looks like, right? Uh, properly, properly curated. The, the only problem, like I said, is that uh, the likelihood of errors being made, right? So typos, for instance, and mis misclassification, because one of the reasons we did this was we were 
wanting to use um, an element that is specific to the collection um, as a label for training the, the model, right? To tell the model to say, when you see text in the abstract that is that has text that has these elements, then this should be in the School of Natural Sciences. So if you find computer software, um, computer software and whatnot, then that should be in the School of Natural Sciences because the Department of Computer Sciences is in the School of Natural Sciences or something, right? Um, oh, we still have plenty of time. Um, okay, and then the. PDFs, right? Remember I said we used the OI or E protocol to do that. What we did was we, so this is the output you get, but within this output you have links to the actual PDF document. So again, just simple scripting here, you just pull out the link to the PDF document and then you use, uh, uh, I guess, Linux utilities like wget or something as part of like the scripts that you come up with to download the PDF documents. Right. Um, because uh, the content of the cover, cover page was uh, part of the uh, hard uh, uh, input features that we needed, we had to strip out the cover pages from the document. Um, in certain instances, it was trivial because if the uploaded manuscript has all the different parts tied together, you just say, get page one. PDFTK, slice out page one, slice out page, page one, right? It was a bit problematic in instances when um, um, well, in instances when you had multiple documents, PDF documents associated with one dissertation, this is one dissertation. It's uploaded as cover page, content, preliminary pages, and this is in fact a bibliography here. But of course, again, this is, there's nothing new here. Just stitch the different documents together, or we discovered that. The, the file with the smallest size was the cover page. That's the assumption we're making. Not accurate, but close to the truth, right? We're just looking for, uh, of all these different meta documents, which one has the smallest size, if it has the smallest size, it is our cover page, get that, right? Um, so, uh, input, um, input data that we came up with, uh, part, part of the input data is here, cover page, uh, Texture content in here, and of course the usual things because you're working with uh, linear algorithms that require uh, that that would work on text. This is PDF. You just do a PDF to text. The only challenge we had is we have uh, quite a number of documents in the repository that were scanned, right? Um, uh, what worked for us was I think we used uh, is it Tesseract or something? If my memory serves me right. Uh, convert what worked best for us was convert the scanned PDF into an image and then the image into text. Not directly PDF to text, but for the bond digital PDF documents, just PDF to text worked just fine. And in fact, I can show you some sample output just now. Um, I think so that you we. No. So, I don't know if I have output from Tesseract. I was running out of space on this machine, so I, I um, right, so, right, so this, is, so what worked best for us, and I, I wish I had uh, an example of uh, something that was scanned. I'll search for an example, and then I'll show it to you. So this is, ultimately, this is what we wanted, because this was supposed to be our input to the implicit anyway, to the models, right? This is what we needed to transform. So, so you see where we're coming from, PDFs, convert the PDF to text and then transform the text. Um, okay. And then all, all of this will, you'll notice will become trivial very soon by the, way we get, by, by the time we get halfway through this course. Um, so some other things that we did, um, because it turns out that upon understanding the, uh, upon Upon understanding the business, we realized that <clears throat> one way of distinguishing, for us to come up with a, a, a model that is able to tell you, say this is a dissertation, master's dissertation, this is a PhD thesis, uh, DIGS has guidelines that explicitly state to say if it is a dissertation, it must be less than 
Is it 40,000 words? So you can translate the number of words to number of pages. And so what we did was we used as input, um, uh, well, we just run PDF info on the PDF documents, right? Once you stitch them together, run PDF info, all the things you have are the number of pages, and then we're just interested in extracting this number. So for this particular data set, the only thing we're interested in, you see it's a long way up the top, right? The only thing we're interested in is just this number for each of those dissertations, right? Um, something else we use as a data source here is uh, information from Medlin, and this was specific to the implementation of the subject uh, classification model. And we used the uh, dissertation from the School of Medicine as an exemplar to showcase that this is actually possible. So we downloaded properly curated data from Medlin, right? These are baseline files that are generated, I think, every year or something, um, easily available. So we took advantage of what's normally called in literature transfer learning, right? So you, try, you train a model because you're working with text, you train a model using this, and then you apply it to, to UNSA content but specific to School of Medi Medicine here, or dissertations produced by School of Medicine. Um, right, so I mean, like I said, the cleaning process here, because you're working with text, listen, it's the usual things here, stop word removal, and this will become boring very soon, stop word removal, stemming, um, something that you can do even when you're asleep, but stop word removal, stemming, case folding, Right, so, so that um, you have text that you can easily transform. Okay. I'll show you examples just now. And then because some of this information was coming from different uh, sources, we had to merge the information at some stage. Like for instance, I think we had to merge uh, the data set that had uh, dissertation and pages with the data set that has the abstract. Because you need, remember you need, trans one of the things we, we had to do was transform the textual content associated with abstracts and titles into those numbers we saw. Uh, that particular data set is separate from the data set that has a number of pages. But because we know that each dissertation will be associated by those different parts, you have to merge them at some stage. Right. Um, you merge them so that you ultimately come up with, no, there's no example here, but imagine Imagine there's another, imagine this is merged with this. Because this would be an example of uh, text transform, the titles of the abstract transformed. This is one record. Um, so you'd be merging, assuming this is associated with this record here, or this record, you'd be merging this with this, so that you have one vector. And that's what you'd be working with. Yeah. Anyway, so examples of like uh, preprocessing that was done. If you see the text here below, you can clearly see that this is stemmed. Facey thesis, right? It's case folded also, right? Uh, all lower case, usually uh, all lower case is fine. If you want, you can go all upper case, but don't do cameo case because it would be that would be strange, right? So, but lower case is always good. Uh, punctuation is removed. M dot A. Space C space A space abstract equal sign gone full stop gone full stop gone right uh, rail in brackets Livingstone town blah 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 rail I don't know where he, it is but obviously the opening parenthesis is, is gone right so anyway take our point here is that preprocessing cleaning this is cleaned you do not transform before you clean you stem you remove stop words. Um, you, what else do you do? You remove punctuations, a whole host of things that you do, you duplicate and whatnot, and then you transform. Right. We, we have dedicated lecture sessions for this. Just, let's not lose track of the fact that I'm giving an example of the processes associated with the CRISP-DM model, right? Implementation, very trivial process. Because you have transformed data, and I'm working with text, I know which estimators I must use. Support vector machines, random forests, right? Um, some of these things are already there in literature. All you have to do is read. Literature will tell you to say when you're working with text, these are the standard learning algorithms you use, and then you work with those. And that's good enough justification. Say, so we used these, we tested, we evaluated these learning algorithms because 
um, uh, because literature says that, yeah, we're wrapping up, sorry. Just like, uh, we'll continue with the other example just now. Uh, but anyway, so modeling, right, uh, feature combinations on all these funny things, um, identifying the estimators to use. In terms of the features, right, that we used here, uh, so uh, TF, TFIDF representation of the title pages, uh, TFIDF representation of the abstract uh, number of pages, TFIDF representation of the metadata, um, TFIDF representation of the baseline files I spoke about, um, and for specific models that we're implementing, I do believe this is the subject classifier, uh, the comprehensive list of features, the title abstract, combination of the title and the abstract, combination of the title abstract and the parent mesh uh, heading. Um, and then for, I believe this is the ETD uh, classifier model, uh, TFIDF representation of the, oh, TF, TFIDF representation of content on the cover page, which is the title page. Um, because it turns out that the things that you find on the cover page will tell you whether it's a master's or uh, master's or PhD. Uh, uh, number of pages for the ETD, uh, combination of textual representation of content on the uh, uh, title page or cover page uh, and the pages, right? Uh, and what you're doing when you're evaluating is you're paying particular attention to these things. Already here you can see that in terms of the feature combination, what is appropriate is just the Textual representation of the content on the cover page. Why? Because it has 99.1% accuracy. This is 97.1% accuracy. It's less than this. This is certainly higher than this, but it's less than this. So I know that whatever it is I'm working with, I'm going to use this feature here. Right? Uh, this is another model. Which one is this? I think this is a collection. Again, look at the numbers here for the collection. Um, uh, so I would set off for either a combination of what we did here, we set out for a combination of title and abstract, in our case. Uh, these are the same, but we just, to be on a safe side, we said we are going to combine title and abstract. And by the way, the accuracy is bad because uh, there are different disciplines here, and the different disciplines can be best uh, explained using uh, this confusion matrix here. Right, uh, but just with evaluation again, so efficacy, right? Not efficiency here because it's an offline model, um, and then, I mean, implementation of model results, like I, like I said, it's just looking at these numbers for us. And you'll see the, the deployment to say, in as much as for the technical details, we're interested in these numbers here, precision, F1 score measures, but for the person that is interested in the output, we just tell them as part of the output to say, that thing is, it should go into the School of Education collection. Because this is what they're interested in. And by the way, the person I'm referring to here is the software developer who's going to have to develop the application that uses this API, right? Simple API here. But so again, we'll walk through all these different ways of evaluating um, our models, right? This is a confusion matrix standard for classification problems. Um, in this case, the diagonal line is showing you the accuracy of predicting which collection an ETD belongs to per school, right? So you notice that certain schools, the, 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 the result is not so good, like MS, right? 45%, right? Uh, mining engineering, 47%. Uh, our explanation is simple because we understand the domain. There are certain disciplines that are similar. Mining, engineering, electrical engineering, right? MS, medicine, right? The, the, because we're using text as input features here. Uh, so again, evaluating here, a uh, simple rock cave here, trying to identify which learning algorithm you're going to use, and you soon discover that when we look at evaluation of learning algorithms that when you use a rock cave, you're looking at something that has the highest area, right? So just look for a line that has the highest area. In this case, it would be logistic regression was, was what we used here. See the yellow thing here? Yeah need to zoom in to find out, uh, to see which one was better here. Uh, in terms of the deployment, what we did here is, uh, it's sad really, we were working towards implementation of the web application, but we're working with undergraduate students and uh, third years, they did a horrible job, right? They didn't finish the work, they haven't done anything actually. But what we have done is, we have implemented an API, right? Um, that 
should be used as input to this web-based application. So I have some nice interface that uh, allows a user to be able to see what has been automatically classified and then they will say deposit this into the repository deployment. Right? Uh, if you're interested in playing around with the API, it's, uh, it's available, but the thing is it's a post request so you probably have to use a, a postman or something, but it's here if you want to. There's a, you'll find details of the different endpoints here, right? So there's a collection endpoint, there's a, a type endpoint, there's a subject endpoint 